So how much stuff can we hold in our head at a time? Like, yeah, someone can know the names of all the Pokemon or whatever, but how much stuff can you actively be thinking about at any given time? Like, someone who memorizes the first 100 digits of pi isn't holding all 100 numbers in their mind simultaneously. They're just retrieving them from long-term memory in the right order. But if someone gives you a 10-digit phone number to remember briefly, could you do that? That kind of thing is the question of short-term memory capacity. And certainly short-term memory capacity is limited. It's not infinite. In fact, one metaphor that's used a lot is a leaky bucket. Like, as you're constantly putting new stuff into it, old stuff is leaking out or being pushed out. So how might we test how big the bucket is, how much it can hold? As usual, we often start with something very simple so that we can control confounding variables and kind of get at the basics, and then we'll work our way up to more complex real-world situations. So the easiest test might be reciting back a bunch of numbers you just heard and see how many you can handle before you start to suck at it. We still use this test today, by the way. It's called the digit span task. So if you're doing the digit span task, it might look something like this. And six, five, seven, eight. And then since you got it right, then it's five this time. Depending on the five numbers, if you get it wrong, then they shorten it the next time. And you get the idea. That's the digit span task. So it's like a, a few numbers to remember, then you're prompted to recall them. If you get it right, the next string of digits gets longer and longer and longer and longer. If you get it wrong, though, it gets shorter and shorter and shorter. If you keep adjusting, it keeps going back and forth and kind of probing until it finds the limits of where you're just able to remember that many digits half the time. That's called your digit span. That's one common measure of short-term memory. And the typical digit span is around seven digits. Um, with many people being closer to five or six or closer to eight or nine. So like most people can do an unfamiliar phone number without an area code. But when you add an area code and make it 10 digits, people start to mess up some digits pretty often. Now this range of, you know, around seven or seven plus or minus two, we could say, was so consistent that back in the 50s, a psychologist at Harvard named Miller published an article titled The Magical Number Seven Plus or Minus Two some limits on our capacity for processing information. And that became one of the most cited psychology papers in history. So he found other areas where our brain seems to have kind of a hard limit of around seven plus or minus two items, like in some perceptual judgment tasks. Now he didn't really think it was any sort of magical number, and his view was definitely more nuanced in terms of information processing by us humans, but for basic digit span, seven plus or minus two is actually a pretty good summary number of normal human ability. We now know there are like age effects and practice effects, and it can be a bit different depending on the speed of presentation or whether you present the digits out loud or written on the screen, but still seven plus or minus two is roughly speaking the typical limit for digit span. Meanwhile though, our span for letters is a little bit lower and with simple words called the word span task, how many words you can remember, the typical capacity is around five words. And if we go to something more abstract or visual, it can be even lower. Like there's a test called the Corsi block tapping test, where you see some blocks getting tapped in a random order, and then you have to copy that pattern, remembering the order. So they start with just two blocks, which is super easy, this one, then this one, but then it gets up more and more and more. And every time you get it right, the pattern gets longer until we find your limit, which for most people is about five or six blocks for consistent performance. And for something more complex, like colored squares, so it's visual but has multiple elements, most people max out around four as their span. So really, this idea that our memory is limited to seven plus or minus two items, it makes no sense when it clearly depends on the type of items. And not just the type of items, but other factors, like we're gonna see in this next demo. So let's do a quick test. Grab a piece of paper and something to write with, pause the video if you need to go grab some, Okay, for this task, just try to remember the letters that are presented. So you're gonna see them rather briefly, then there'll be a delay before it asks you to recall them. So once you see the word recall, that's when you'll write it down. But there's gonna be a blank delay, a blank screen for a while, where you just have to remember the letters as best you can. So you're ready? 
Here we go. Recall. So just write it down. Now don't worry if you didn't get it all, just write down something. Okay, hopefully you got as much as you can. Now let's do another trial. Just, again, try your best to remember these letters. Same setup as last time. Ready? Here we go. Recall. All right, so hopefully you wrote down whatever you remember here. Now, here's the letters if you wanna check your answers. Most people miss a lot of letters in the first one, but then end up kicking ass on the second one, even though it's just as many letters and you're, you're also battling against proactive interference effects. So why is the second one so much easier? Because assuming you're in the United States or follow the news at all, you've probably heard those sets of letters together before as a group. So it isn't really being stored as 12 pieces of unique information like the first one, but more like four larger pieces of organized information. The CIA and the FBI are organizations, NBC and CBS, right? Those are TV channels. In fact, Miller, the, the magical number guy, he later revised his argument and stated that we should think of short-term memory capacity in terms of chunks of information like this. And by chunk, we mean a subset of elements that meaningfully cluster together. And of course that meaning might be inherent, but often it's based on your own past experience, which is why NBC might make up a memorable chunk for American television viewers, but not for someone from another country where it's just three random letters to them. And when we measure in terms of chunks, short-term memory capacity is generally around three to four chunks on average. Now, the benefit of chunking as a basic memory mechanism, the reason we have it, is it allows us to hold a lot more information that way. We can remember something like a really long sentence, it's full of words, because of the meaning and the structure of the sentence. But we can't remember an equally long sequence of just random words that don't go together in a sentence. And likewise, eight random digits is normally around the maximum for a lot of people, but when they have meaning to them, when they're organized in a certain way, it's super easy to remember. So 10, 21, 2004 is easy because it's a date. And the one on the left could also be remembered as November 26th, 1995, no problem. But if I said seven, nine, one, five, seven, three, zero, eight, it's easy to forget or mess up one of those digits by the end because there's no structure or meaning to chunk them together. Now that said, memory competition champions, people who win this stuff professionally, they can remember way longer strings than that, not because they have better memories. In fact, many of the world champions have completely average memory, but they practice and practice and practice at tricks that help them create chunks out of anything as you're listening. So. Often memory is less about innate talent and more about meaning and practice. Which brings me to a famous study on this topic by Chase and Simon back in 1973. So Chase and Simon came up with a clever way to test memory, a chessboard. So a chessboard has 64 different locations on it and there are 32 different pieces. So that makes a huge number of possible layouts for a chessboard with even a moderate number of pieces on it. What they did is they would set up a chessboard with some pieces laid out on it, then show it to the participant for just five seconds, letting them look at it and study it for five brief seconds, and then it went away. And then the participant had to reconstruct the layout that they had seen with a fresh board and pieces in front of them, kind of reproducing what they had looked at. Now Chase and Simon did this with beginner chess players who knew the rules but weren't very good at it, and with master chess players who basically played professionally. So you might think master chess players will do better 
and and maybe if they do better it's just because they have better better memory in general or like they're smarter overall but it turns out that doesn't seem to be the case in fact here's the trick chase and simon tried two different conditions in their study in condition one the board that they showed for five seconds was from an actual historical chess game that someone had played, meaning the pieces were in a meaningful and familiar pattern, which is something a chess master is going to recognize. Like, oh, these three pieces are pressuring the queen's file or whatever. Meanwhile, in condition two, they did the same thing, but they showed five seconds of a board with the same pieces placed randomly. So there's no meaning or organization to the information. So we got the same amount of raw information, but in one case it can be meaningfully clumped, at least by some people, and in the other case there's no way to clump it, so you have to remember every piece and its location individually. And here's the result they found on the graph here. When the pieces are placed randomly, so just randomly placed, same number of pieces, both chess masters and chess beginners totally suck at this task. On average, remembering less than three pieces. Like, yikes. But now check out the results when they were shown a real life board with actual meaningful positions on it. The chess masters averaged 16 pieces correctly placed, whereas beginners can only get about four pieces. So the masters did absolutely great when the board is in a meaningful position so that they can perceive it in chunks. Like the way this black knight and black queen are pressuring the pawn in front of the white king at g2 here. But their memory is just as bad as the beginners when the pieces are random and they can't chunk in that way. So the takeaway from this study is it's their practice, their experience with these types of items that provides the meaning and provides the chunkability. Same thing goes for like musicians remembering more notes than non-musicians or anything else like that. It's our experience that allows us to chunk things and thus remember more. But here's the thing. If we're going to start to view short-term memory capacity in terms of chunks, we need to think about what it is that can make up a chunk of information, which requires asking how information is encoded, like how it's represented and stored in the brain. A metaphorical way to think about this would be that we're asking what kind of file format the information is stored at. Like, uh, like do we store things in our memory as chunks of written letters? Or, or as chunks of sounds, like the syllables and phonemes in a word? Or as chunks of pictorial information, like an image? Or, or based on chunks of meaning, or what? So there are a few possibilities that people have put forth. One is that short-term memory uses auditory coding, meaning we represent items in short-term memory based on their sound, based on how they sound. Another possibility is when we're holding things in short-term memory, we're using visual coding. We're representing items based on how they look, like the shape of the letter that you just looked at, the shape of the, the numbers on the screen. And yet, another possibility is semantic coding, that we represent items based on their meaning. So let's start with an example of, of that first one, what that first one, auditory coding, might look like, and why we might think short-term memory uses auditory coding. So for quite a while, in fact, it was thought that short-term memory was, was acoustic, it was auditory and speech-based, while long-term memory stored things based on their meaning or semantics. And here's an example of a study that supported that idea that made us start thinking of short-term memory as acoustic, using acoustic coding. So the study is by Conrad. Based on the results of a study published in 1964, he proposed that we use inner speech to basically remember the sound of the words or the digits or the letters that we're trying to remember. Like when you're holding six numbers in your head, he thinks that even if you're not rehearsing or saying them to yourself, they're being stored as what those numbers sound like. The sound for, not the written word F-O-U-R in the visual shape, not that. So what was the study design that made him think this is the case? Well, during memory tests for something simple like a bunch of letters, he found that when people made mistakes and you know remembered the wrong letter, their errors weren't random. In fact, he found that when people remember the wrong letter in a simple letter memory task, when they remember the wrong letter, it's more likely to be a letter that sounded like the correct response. He called this the phonological similarity effect. So the root phono just meaning sound or voice, like a phone call. So sound similarity effect, basically. Let's see an example of this with a quick demonstration. So get a piece of paper and something to write with. Pause the video if you need to. 
And what I'm going to do is just show you a series of letters that you have to remember in the correct order. So this is what we call a serial recall task, where order does matter. So the letters will go by one at a time, then it'll say recall at the end, at which point write down all of the letters in order. Are you ready? Here we go. Recall. And just do the best you can. Now we'll come back in a second to check your answers. But let's try one more time with a new trial. Let's do one more trial of this. So it's going to be the same deal. Letters will go by, and then at the end when it says recall, just write them down. So you ready? Here we go. Just write down what you can remember in order. So, okay, let's see how you did. Here are the letters. You might count up how many you got in the right position just to kind of compare the two. Now, what we find is most people do worse and they make more errors on the first set than the second one even though it's the same number of letters to remember. So you'd think your letter span would be pretty much the same. But no, the first set seems to be much harder because they all sound similar. All the letters, when you pronounce them out loud, have some overlap because of the E sound, like G, Z, D, B, P, and so on. They have the E. So it's more likely to mix them up, suggesting in short-term memory they're being stored based on their sound. In the second set, the sounds are much more distinct. M, J, Y, F, H, R, right? Don't, don't have the overlap. They don't have the E sound all in common. So results like this related to phonemic similarity effect, they seem pretty convincing. Short-term memory information appears to be stored with an auditory code, saved more like an MP3 file format than a picture of how the letter looks on the screen or the meaning of the letter. Of course, you might wonder if something like words would be different since they can hold meaning in a way that standalone letters really don't. So a well-known memory researcher named Alan Badalay tried out the same basic idea, but with memory for word lists. So he would present a list of one syllable words that in one condition all sounded alike, like cap and map, and in another condition were related not based on sound, but based on semantics or meaning like big and huge, which don't sound similar, but both mean large. And then he had a couple control conditions of words not being related in either way. So if the code for remembering words is acoustic, it should be harder to recall words that sound alike, more mistakes in that first condition. If you wanna get a feel for the procedure, we'll, we'll try just one simplified little trial. I'll show you some words and, and you just have to write them down at the end in order. So it's a serial recall task. Again, pause if you need to grab a pen and paper. Okay, here we go. Recall. So in that condition, you just write down all the words, which in this case, they happen to all rhyme, right? They all sounded the same. But you write down all those words in the correct order. And this, this was a really simple version, right? Because we only had six words and he had just seen cap and map in my previous example. But that at least gives you an idea of the kind of test he did, right? So that would be the phonological similarity condition. And what did he find? Well, sure enough, this is our uh, performance on the left here. So for short-term memory, phonological similarity, in other words, acoustic similarity, sounding the same, 
that seemed to interrupt performance. It caused more memory errors. We make more mistakes in remembering words that sound similar than words that mean the same thing, suggesting that for short-term memory, they aren't being stored based on meaning, but based on sound. Now with a bunch of practice on the same list over and over and over, if we had you do that same list that you just saw and you did it over and over and over and practice and practice and practice, that'll get it into long-term memory. And in long-term memory, he found that the acoustic effect went away. So after even just four or so repeats, seeing the same list four times, at that point it's getting into long-term memory. So they, they, uh, the um, phonological similarity effect kind of went away and semantic issues seem to be more of a problem. So the overlapping meanings seem to cause more long-term memory errors in that semantic condition for long-term memory. But like I said, for short-term memory, you can see why people assume short-term memory uses acoustic coding and then long-term memory uses more semantic meaning-based coding. Makes sense. But what about those other possibilities we talked about? Is there any evidence for, say, visual coding in short-term memory? Maybe it just depends on the stimulus we're trying to remember. I mean, we definitely had a visual component to the letters and the words that we saw, right? They flashed on the screen. And, and it didn't seem to utilize that, right? We were, we were seeing acoustic as the main code. So visual coding certainly isn't the default. When we have two choices, it seems like acoustic is the default. But what about when auditory coding is harder to do or doesn't naturally fit the task? So we started to get good evidence of this in controlled lab studies in the 90s, like with this procedure by uh, Della Sala, I'm going to show you a picture, then it'll disappear, and you have to wait for a delay, after which the, the recall prompt, you're going to try and draw the picture that you saw on scratch paper. So you're just trying to remember the picture for a short delay, then draw what you saw. Does that make sense? So I have a piece of paper and pen ready. Pause if you need to go grab it. Here we go. I'm going to show you the picture. After the delay, when it says recall, that's when you'll draw it. Draw it now. So this one was pretty simple. You probably got it. Um, so the, I'm going to do another task, another another trial, of the same thing. And again, it's going to be the same idea. So boxes, either you know, dark or light, black or white boxes. So here we go. Let's do another trial. Uh, same idea. You're going to see a pattern briefly. It'll be pretty fast. Just remember that pattern during the delay, and then when it says recall is when you draw it. So here we go. Okay, recall. Just draw it out. This one is obviously harder. <laughs> yeah, so just kind of put whatever you remember. This is just a demonstration. Don't worry about it being exact. But this one's harder, but that's the idea with uh, De La Salle's visual patterns test is what he called this. We can manipulate the number of items to remember in a very spatial kind of task where there's no obvious way to quickly encode things auditorily, like your brain doesn't naturally convert those patterns to a sound or a verbal pattern, like light, dark, light, light, dark, dark, light, 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 dark, light, light, dark, dark. So by trying different sizes, he would manipulate the size of this array and you know which square is black or white was randomized. When he, when he tried this, he found that most people could do like a three by three matrix, so around nine squares pretty easily. And likely that's because we're chunking together some of the light and dark areas. Like if we're just shown the, oops, sorry, if we're just shown the three by three pattern highlighted here in the corner, we might remember the three black squares in the bottom as like a single L-shaped corner chunk, right? So, so we chunk, we might be chunking things visually. Uh, it's not necessarily that we're visually encoding nine individual items. And there's a there's a limit to it, right? A maximum span for most of us, but. 
the important thing here is that the task he set up has no easy auditory coding possible. And when we test it, people don't seem to be using auditory coding for it. So for at least some stimuli, our short-term memory seems to be able to hold things in a genuinely visual, or you might say visuospatial, code. Which means short-term memory may not always use the same code. It may use a mix of codes. So what about semantic coding? We know long-term memory relies heavily on that, but is there any evidence that our short-term memory is encoding things based on their meaning? And we have evidence of that just from the release from proactive interference task that we talked about before. The one where we switched from lists of, you know, fruits into a, to a professions or some other list like that. That suggests that short-term memory items are represented based on their meaning, their category, right? And that's why changing categories changes those interference effects. So what we've got, the answer to the question we started with of how information is coded in short-term memory, seems to be that short-term memory uses a combination of codes. It depends on the circumstance and the stimulus. Though it does seem like when we can use auditory coding easily, there's more of a default for our brain to use that for short-term memory. So just to summarize what we've learned about short-term memory, its capacity is limited to a few chunks, like three to four is a common number that you'll hear. It's got short duration, like generally 15 to 30 seconds if we're not allowed to rehearse indefinitely. New information bumps out older information, so a sort of interference seems to explain a lot of our forgetting rather than a pure time-based decay mechanism. It stores things in a mix of codes or kind of file formats, so to speak. And there are certain control processes, things like rehearsal, which are under our control and allow us to extend the duration or to help move the information to long-term memory, which remember could be like, you know, remembering something five minutes later, not just five days or five years later. Long-term memory is basically anything else, anything longer than this limited short-term store. By the way, remember back to that coursey block tapping task that I mentioned? Where, where people we test, including like neuropsychology patients, they have to repeat back the order in which some blocks were tapped by the researcher or, or flashed by the computer. We can easily test our cousin, the chimpanzee, on the same kind of task using a touchscreen computer. So actually, I wanna show you a video of Ayumu, a, a chimp at uh, Kyoto University, where I visited for a primatology conference years ago. You'll see some numbers flash in front of him, and he has to tap the numbers in the correct numerical order, just based on past experience with which number comes before which number. And if he gets it right, he gets a little squirt of yummy juice. So let's see how he does. <laughs> Pretty crazy, right? He's able to pull a lot from sensory memory into short-term memory in a visual spatial layout. And then he taps through them in the correct order. It was pretty impressive. And he's getting a little squirted juice when he gets it right. And a sound if he doesn't, and then it just goes to the next trap. So here you can see a person doing a version of it, where in this case it skips some numbers, but the same idea, it just doesn't have all the numbers on there. You know, it's, it's a little challenging because it flashes very fast. Now, meanwhile, here's a Yumu doing that harder version. Even after looking away, getting distracted, he's still got the information into short-term memory. It's kind of crazy. It's also pretty impressive because in this later condition where some numbers are missing, it shows he didn't just learn a trick where one stimulus is followed by the next stimulus. Like, we could teach a dog to, try to kind of tap arbitrary things in order, but here he seems to have a basic understanding of which number is bigger than which other number. But yeah, they, they published a study with college students doing the same task to, to compare, and people were not nearly as good as a chimp like a Yumu at doing this particular type of memory. Of course, he also got a lot of practice on it, so maybe it's not the most fair comparison.
At any rate, that's the main stuff I wanted to talk about with short-term memory. But before we move on to long-term memory, there's one more super important thing to talk about. You see, nowadays you won't actually run into the term short-term memory very often in cognitive psychology research articles. Instead, you're more likely to hear this other term, which gets used in a similar context, which is working memory. So in the next video, we'll talk about working memory to wrap up this topic before we move on to long-term memory as a big old thing of its own.